lounge, son. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan. And today, I'm going to be talking about Suicide Squad number one, 1987. This is a great era of DC Comics. I've been talking about, you know, on a lot of the vids, vids I've done over the last few months, how much I love this era of DC. What a great cover. This easily could be like a movie poster, you know, for a Suicide Squad movie. Written by the great John Ostrander, Luke McDonald, Carl Kiesel on art. Look at, I mean, just the call out right here. These eight people put their lives on the line for our country. One of them won't be coming home. What a great tagline also for a cover. You don't often see them doing this on covers anymore. Before I get into it, though, I want to remind everybody, if you're not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon. You know, we drop vids on the daily. There's over 700 videos on the channel. A bunch of cool playlists you can check out, including a DC 80s playlist, which is where this will live. Interviews, all sorts of stuff. Even an interview with the great John Ostrander is on here as well. You can search that in the search bar. But um, excited again to talk about this. So let's jump straight into this. We open up at an airport. Air Force One is about to approach. They're at the Gotham City. At the Gotham City Airport is where they are. I see the suspicious guy. We see him staring, standing out. He's looking at another guy over across the way, makes eyes. And we see that they're probably up to something. Uh, one thing I want to call out is I love the way they do the credits here. This feels very cinematic to me. Like you got the John Ostrander writer here, Luke McDonald penciler, Carl Kiesel inker, Todd Klein letterer, Carl Gafford colorist, Robert Greenberger editor. I, I, Instead of doing it like on the bottom, which a ton of comics do, I don't know that I've ever seen it laid out quite like that. And it's exactly like you would see in a movie as you're going from scene to scene. And I think it was a brilliant thing. It's something, you know, I didn't notice on first read when I read this, you know, a few years ago. Obviously, like we can see these guys look like terrorists, right? He's got a bag. Obviously, there's going to be a bomb in there. He puts it off to the side. People are waiting there to meet the president. We see the plane land and he has this microchip record, like a, I guess like a recorder to communicate. He's like, now. And immediately this portal opens up. We get this this guy who, I, I don't know his name. I think maybe he was introduced um, in this comic book. But at this point, we don't know who he is. And he comes in and he starts, they start attacking. And then we see this terrorist guy jumping through the portal. He's killed Jerry. My baby. Where's my baby? Where are the cops? And we see this, basically this group of, you know, superpower terrorists attacking and killing people. The cops. I thought we were supposed to watch the mayor and the governor. The feds will take care of them. Move. And then we see this thing jump up and he's like, what the devil is that? Not devil. Dijin. So he's like a technological digital genie. Pretty crazy, dude. And he's getting blasted by the cops. This guy's blasting people, mowing them down. Call out to this. One of my favorite series of all time. I mean, look at this. We're the tough. We're the proud. We're the all new Justice League. All new adventures. All new team. Again, I said I love this era. This is one of my favorite from this era. Keith Giffen, J.M.D. Matias, Kevin McGuire, and Terry Austin on this Justice League series. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend. There's a couple of videos where we go through it. You know, we talk about the first collection. Talk about uh, the punch hurt around the world of Batman knocks Guy Gardner out. But go check those out. Anyways, let's get back to this. So, you know, we see that. We got to get the president out of here. Here he comes. This terrorist chokes him out with this metal wire. Goes in there. Stabs this dude. This guy gets mowed down. And you can see these are like radical terrorists. You know, 3,000 more years more, Ocali. And Air Force One. This is their tower. But airport's under attack. Repeat. Air, under attack. Get airborne. And so they try to get airborne. But the other guy comes in. And he forms this metal or this fire sword. Takes out the wheel so they can't they can't fly off. Then he says, recall, stand by, go. He gets back, airports crash, destroyed, and the president is seemingly killed. The digital uh, you know, genies sucked back into this machine. This guy goes back out, and we're left with this massive scene of people dying. Some people have survived, but for the most part, there is just bodies strewn everywhere. And then we see time of attack. From initiation of final draw, one minute, seven seconds, General. Initial estimated casualty, 300 to 500 at least. And with at least that many, again, wounded. How long before we have the exact figures, Mushtack? You know, six hours of the initial body. 24 to 36 hours for the detailed report. And, you know, they, you know, this is the jihad that has attacked. And, you know, very timely of, you know, the 80s and stuff. And 
a, a lot of this was prevalent, you know, um, in some of the DC books. You had the Middle Eastern country of Korak. That country was definitely prevalent in a lot of the DC comics at the time. Then we pan out. We go to Bell Reeve Prison in Louisiana. And they talk about the prison, how, you know, inside an old southern plantation. Uh, it was built in the swamp. This prison is home to superpowered felons. And we talk about this new prisoner that just got in, the Parasite, which is definitely looks different than the Parasite that we all know, the purple Parasite. But, um, you know, I guess he was introduced back then. He killed, talking about killed 20 people. It's fire, uh, Firestorm 58 and 59. No one knows where he is to start with. Human, alien, mutant. He was a citizen of, is he, was he a citizen? If so, a jurisdiction. What do you do with him while you try to figure it out? I mean, look, they're bringing in rats to keep him alive, but not super alive because he takes, you know, he can, he absorbs the energy from living creatures. Isn't the ACLU going to do something about it? Sure. So is the ASBCA. And, you know, she's like, well, doesn't it bother you? Well, like if the terror, you know, parasite was loose, that would terrify me worse. Now this reporter is leaving and, you know, Miss Mrs. Waller is giving the all clear, Amanda Waller. You know, she is the person that's responsible for putting together the Suicide Squad. Task, she runs Task Force X. You know, she's talking to the you know psychologist. Like, I just need you to tell me if they're fit for the mission. Well, I've told you before that I think the Suicide Squad is a terrible name psychologically for this group, which is true. You call them the Suicide Squad, which basically means like their lives are mean nothing, right? They're they're expendable. The most current issue of Secret Origins, I guess, gives like the backstory on the past of this team. I haven't read that issue. And so, you know, we come in and we meet Plastique, who's right here. We got Mindboggler, uh, which is right there. Mindboggler isn't a character I really knew of uh, prior to this. I knew everybody else on the team um, except Mindboggler, but they're giving you the rundown. Plastique, you know, talks about how, you know, you take this mission and your sentence gets changed to time served. Provided, of course, that you survive and keep your trap shut afterwards. You got Captain Boomerang. He's such a cocky little douchebag. You know, now we're going to get the intro to the team. We got Colonel Rick Flagg, who's the commander. He took the leadership of the former squad, trying to ameliorate feelings of guilt stemming from the death of his father, the squad's first leader, which that squad was not filled with super, uh, super villains. It was just regular soldiers. Now he's got this new team. You know, you got Floyd Lawton, a.k.a. De uh, Deadshot. You have the psychologist talking about, like, the minds, um, you know, the mental state of all of these people. You got... Second in command, Bronze Tiger. You know his story. Yeah, he was brainwashed into serving the League of Assassins. Partial amnesiac. Then you got Miss June Moon, a.k.a. the Enchantress. She's got her own issues, right? Like, she's got split personality. Maybe we need a parapsychologist for that because she's got schizophrenia. Then we got, you know, look at him. Digger Harkness, a.k.a. Captain Boomerang. The point is, they're all bruised personalities, including Flag. Some of them should be institutionalized, the doctor saying. They could probably do what you want, but I'm concerned as to what it will do to them. She doesn't care. And she even says it. It doesn't bother me much. Well, it bothers me that your agents expendable ones at that. But to me, they're my patients and I resent your cavalier attitude. Amanda Waller continues to be this character. I think like one of the best depictions of her in, in anything, comic books included, shows, TV, movies, is her in the animated, DC animated series. I think she was done really well there. I think she's become such a figure point for, especially what's modern DC is doing with this like new crossover, absolute power. She's, you know, she's very skeptical on super, on super powered heroes. And, and so she is constantly at battle with them. And so for her to like, now on the flip side, take the villains and use them to her own, whim, for her own whims and her own political agendas. That's the impetus behind so much of what John Ostrander's Super Side Squad run is. There's a lot of political intrigue. A lot of political missions that she sends them on for her own gain for the you know U.S. government, and instead of the chips in their head, which is what eventually she uses to control them because she'll blow their head up if they don't do what she wants, using these bracelets. It's funny because Plastique kind of comments on these you know bracelets that are slapped on their wrist. If I wander too far, it'll blow my arm off. Why are mind boggling? I the only ones wearing it. So Captain Boomerang, a little cocky, he's like, let me let me tell you. It's so you don't wander off without doing the job. But the others, we've proved ourselves. <laughs> and Amanda's like, why don't you slap one on Captain Boomerang again? Because he's such a jerk and a screw up. So he gets all cocky, but now he's got that same bracelet that uh, Plastic and Mindboggler have. And now we're going to get the mission. You know, Quark's military resources have been recently crushed by Superman. And, it, and this is going into Adventures of Superman issues 427, 428. 
And we see that Quark unveiled their jihad superpower terrorists for hire. And they made up this site. It wasn't real what they said. It was a way to train them. And it was made up to look like an American airport just to make it real impressive that jihad killed real people. So they use real people, but they just made it look like an American airport. And I love I love this scene right here, like the coloring where it's all like in shadow. And you just see uh, Floyd Lawton with his cigarette in his mouth. Captain Boomerang, well, it impressed me. Glad to hear it, Boomerang, because the jihad's your target. We know from our people that the jihad been, have been hired to stage an attack within a week. It'll be inside the U.S. and will probably target the president. So we're going to hit them first. Very like black ops stuff. Again, doing the dirty work that you couldn't send a super man on, right? You couldn't send a lot of these heroes because they can't be beholden to one country. Amanda Waller doesn't give a shit. And so now we're getting, you know, just like we got the lowdown on our he uh, well, our heroes, our our t our our team that's fighting for for uh the country, we're getting the the members now here. We got Russ Nam, you know, talking about his like flaming centaur that materializes, it'll cut through anything. We got the Jijin, world's first digitized man. We got Manicore, this guy. We got Jakuli. We got the only female member, the Chimera. And so now that they've gotten the whole lowdown um, of the people that they got to go up against, they, they're they sent on their mission to this you know headquarters that's in the southern part of Quarek, and it's called Jotunheim, which um, they claim is built by a race of giants. And so, you know, again, the admin... The, the U.S. needs somebody that, you know, if something goes wrong, they can disavow any, you know, ties to. And, of course, they can do that with supervillains, right? Because they're like, well, why would we team up with supervillains? It's the perfect cover. Such a great concept. And I just absolutely love this run. This John Ostrander stuff. There's so much great stuff that comes from this. Eventually, you know, Barbara Gordon Oracle makes her debut in this run. Like, not Barbara Gordon, but um, her Oracle uh, alter ego debuts in this. Just so much, you know, great backstory. Again, it ties into Secret Origins 14. I, I'd love to pick that up and, and dive a little deeper into that because, you know, Rick Flagg comes upon this woman named Karen. You know, he's talking about, you know, his previous team. I love Mindboggle. I, I don't know her well and didn't know her until this run, but I love what she does to Captain Boomerang when he's, like, talking about how he doesn't really respect, you know, um, Plastic or Mindboggler, and she's able to use her powers and shows the rest of the Flash Rogues Gallery laughing at him. Or the Justice League laughing. You got Flash, Batman, and Superman calling him a loser and a clown. I, I love this. Look how mad he gets. He throws a boomerang. St Bronze Tiger stops it. And Rick Flagg is like, you throw one at a team member again and I'll literally blow your arm off. That's just to show you that just because they're a quote-unquote team does not mean that they like each other. They're thrown together all for their own reasons. all And all of them selfish. Like They just want their, their prison sentences either wiped out or lowered. And so... You got a soldier like Rick Flagg. You got Bronze Tiger, who's like, I wouldn't necessarily call him a supervillain. He had ties to the League of Assassins, but, you know, he's, I would say, more of an anti-hero. They're on their mission, and I love this, you know, at we end, he's like, looks like we're off to a flying start. Could be worse. Probably will be. Let's get going. Next, trial by fire. So we get this editorial by editor Bob Greenberger, and he talks about how this almost, you know, could have gone differently. If in the summer of 86, he could have been here telling you all about the genesis of the challenges of the unknown revival. Instead, we're here celebrating the revival of the Suicide Squad, a series that never had its own title. We get this whole backstory of the impetus about how this came to be. We talk about in the Legends miniseries by John Byrne, where the Suicide Squad, you know, was revived and debuted in there. That's a series that I definitely want to talk about, that four-issue miniseries, Post-Crisis on Infinite Earths. Very, um, very awesome book. Great first issue. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. Go pick up the trades. Go find the singles, however you can. Uh, it's a great read. And while you're at it, make sure you like, follow, subscribe. Hit the bell icon so you're notified every time a new vid drops. And on that note.